Well, good morning to everybody. It's really great to be back among you today. And if you're watching online, a special welcome to you. I can see everyone's faces here this morning. Thank you for wearing your masks, by the way, but I can't see your face if you're watching online. I hope you'll let us know that you're present with us. You are family, just like we are family gathered here today. I love our opening hymn today. It's a wonderful call to worship. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me with his arms in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. Would you stand with me as we sing together? You may be seated. I love the words of that hymn, especially that last verse, in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. This hymn was written well over 250 years ago by Joseph Hart, and he really wrote it as a spiritual autobiography, his own, talking about his own journey home. In his own words, he tells us that he drifted far from the church and far from the God that loved him. And he said, I was a loose backslider, an audacious apostate, and a bold-faced rebel. But at the age of 45, God stood in his grace and his love and in his forgiveness to welcome him back home. And Joseph's heart, life was forever changed. And our prayer this morning as we go to God in prayer is that wherever you are in your journey of life, that you might find your way home to God this morning. Let us pray together. Would your eyes and your, eye, your head bowed, your eyes closed as I lead us in this time of prayer, I I do want to invite you home, back home to, with your Heavenly Father. So as we, we begin our prayer together this morning, allow yourself to rest in God's presence. Just breathe in slowly and deeply. Exhale gently. Relax your shoulders, loosen the grip of your hands, and just for a moment, allow yourself to be present, to be at home with God. So in this stillness, how is it with your soul today? 
Is your soul weary? Are you carrying burdens? What fills your mind with worry today? Oh, Father, give rest to our souls this morning. Be near us. Anchor us and those we love in your strength and power. Remind us, our God, that we are never alone. As you allow yourself to rest in God's presence, consider where the woundedness is in your own life. We all struggle with brokenness. Each of us have lost our way. Yet, we are all invited to come to Jesus just as we are. So, Savior of us all, we need your grace and we need your forgiveness. Lord, have mercy on us. Heal and restore our souls this day. And as we pray this morning, do you feel near or do you feel distant from God? Sometimes our distance and issues in other relationships create a distance in our relationship with our Creator as well. Other times we drift from God because we just become distracted and lose our way. This day, our Jesus longs to welcome us home. Oh, God, we thank you that you love us just as we are. Give us our courage today, our God, to arise and come to you with our burdens, with our brokenness, even with our wounded and weary souls. Oh, God, embrace us this morning with your love. pray all this in the love and in the hope of the one who embraces us in his arms, Jesus, our Christ, the very one who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing to our sacred head, How Wounded.
Hi First Church. We are headed over to Callison Elementary with a car full of food and supplies. And we just wanted to say thank you. It's because of your generous giving that when we hear of a need in our community, we're able to jump into action. Um, this week has been so tough on so many with the winter weather and your giving is allowing us to bless those in our community. And we're so grateful. Thank you. So that was a, a loading of materials that went to Callison Elementary School, which we are partnering with together in ministry, and we were able to uh, offer food and supplies to 30 families this week uh, that are at Callison Elementary. And so that's one of the ways we're reaching out. Another way is through UMCOR, our partnership that we do across the domination, which is the United Methodist Commission on Relief. And uh, so we sent, because of your generosity, $6,300 that is helping people in disaster relief uh, right now. And so that's both in this very area here as well as out into our community. And, and we want you to know that if you are needing a particular, uh, if you are needing help at this time around that, you can just send it to UMCOR, U-M-C-O-R, at fumc-rr.org. And if you'll do that and contact us there, that would be wonderful, and then we can make connections to the help that is there. But just thank you for your generosity that is just touching lives in so many ways. Also, this is a time when our ministry as a church is just gearing up with our children, our, our youth, and our adults, and all of it is coming together and lives are being touched. Uh, I saw it this week in a memorial service in which our, our Stephen ministry people were there. We are there in ministry together as a community and then reaching out to transform our community, and it's making a huge difference. Thank you for your part in that. Uh, when you share it in your giving, that's part of this ministry. You can uh, offer your gifts in the baskets as you leave today, or if you're visiting us online or worshiping with us online, uh, we invite you to go to our website and give uh, to there. Um, and also, you can always text give, which is at first hope at 44321. Again, thank you for what you do in the name of Christ. Now, I know you saw the governor's orders this week, and that allows us to continue to be thinking about where we move as a church uh, as we're coming our way out of COVID. Now, uh, all along, we have partnered uh, with our denomination, with uh, some of our state agencies, with the CDC, uh, with experts in our congregation, all of that has been working together, and so it will continue to do. Uh, and so, for instance, we have the governor's proclamation, but our insurance is connected to CDC. What do you do with that? Uh, and in all of this, the priorities, how do we serve one another best in love? And so I ask that you continue to pray for our trustees and for our church council as we navigate what are going to be changing waters in the coming weeks. In the meantime, thank you again for, for wearing your masks and sharing in the uh, physical distances and hear these two words for now. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for the chance in times like these to be the community and the body of Christ, each bringing gifts each bringing our journeys of faith together to bless our world. So we ask that you bless each gift and each giver and bless the ministry of First United Methodist Church of Round Rock. In the name of Christ, amen.
I want to say thanks to our choir for preparing us for Holy Communion in just a beautiful, beautiful way. In the first communion that Jesus did, the times were confusing, and there was a lot of pain, a lot of fears. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus wanted to give them symbols of his ever-present love that we could always count on. And so today, we draw together to that common love. Let us celebrate together in the Feast of the Lord. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take a moment now just to offer yourself just as you are. You did that in the beginning of worship, but maybe this is a place where you unload a burden, confess something that doesn't measure up, and offer that to the Lord in silence. And now hear these words from the heart of God himself. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. And on the night in which he gave, him for, gave himself for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. 
gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Would you join me? Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I would invite Pat and David to come and join me at the table here. Uh, for those in person, you will be taking uh, communion the, uh, the way uh, that you received your elements as you came in today, and I would invite you to uh, open those elements so that you can share. Uh, for those who are watching online, you will be taking communion as I am doing. So the body of Christ, broken for you, take and eat. And the blood of Christ, shed for you, take and drink. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time at this table with you. And Lord, amidst all that is happening around us, we are resting in the constancy of crucified and resurrected love. Lord, thanks for that being our steadying and our hope in all things. In the name of Christ, amen. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 45 to verse 49. Would you please stand with me for the reading of the gospel? From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi! Lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. I, I like our new nameplate with a little star coming across. It reminds me of the old NBC's The More You Know. Um, so hopefully we can give you a little more than you knew when you came in here about the love and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We're continuing our sermon series on crosswords, these seven last words from Jesus on the cross, or Jesus' journey to the cross. And we were inspired by um, Susan Robb's book, book, Seven Words, and I'm, we'll be actually doing a conversation with her on Sunday the 21st at 7 o'clock, and if you're interested in that, hearing about her book, we brought her in before to talk about her book, 
called, and so this is her second book, so we're excited to have this conversation with her on Sunday the 21st at 7 p.m., and so if you'd like to be a part of it, you can go online. It will be on Zoom. She'll be in Dallas, but it'll still be a fun, engaging time with the author of this book, which helped inspire our, our sermon series. So if you have time, I'd love for you all to enjoy us, uh, to join us in that conversation. Some of you have had a, a great week. Others, maybe a more challenging week. You may agree with what we have to say here or disagree with what we have to say here. But in the name of Jesus Christ, everyone is welcome here. Let us go to God in prayer. Ever-present God, we love you. No matter what we're going through, you are there. If we feel that we're on the mountaintop or we're in the valley of the shadow, you are always there. Loving us and showing us a better way to reflect your kingdom of God here on earth. And we rejoice in that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever felt like you're in a God-forsaken place? Maybe you're driving through Texas and you go by one of those little abandoned towns. It used to be vibrant, full of life. Now the only residents are snakes and tumbleweeds. Perhaps you been by Death Valley in California, or watched a Hallmark movie marathon. These people, these things seem void of life, void of good acting, void of the presence of God. Or maybe you yourself felt the absence of God in your life. Maybe you're going really through a challenging season of life. Maybe it's been the pandemic, a job loss, a prolonged illness, or maybe it was the recent winter storms. Hey God, it's me. Where are you? Your soul just seems to be in great agony. You just feel this emptiness all about you. You may be thinking, God, haven't I been doing everything right? I've checked all the boxes of being a good Christian, and you're nowhere to be found in my life. Life's not supposed to be this way. Life seems to be mocking you and leaving you dead on the cross. Jesus just had gone through an unjust trial. He was beaten, spit, whipped, mocked, carried a heavy burden, nails were driven into his body between two insurrectionists. Before any of this happens, he had this conversation with God, hey, can I get out of this horrible moment? But there he was, hung on the cross, dying from his own bodily fluids, then around lunchtime, the earth went dark. I wonder if it's what some of us felt like a couple weeks ago when the lights went out in Texas, as our houses starting to get colder and colder, us wondering, would there ever be light in our houses again? And three hours later, in a loud voice, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This can be the most challenging words uttered by Jesus. In Matthew and Mark, these are actually the last words Jesus speaks on the cross. In John, the words are, I thirst, and Pat will be preaching on it next week. There are many theological ponderings of why Jesus said this. It's because last words are important. We want to hone in and focus on the last words anybody spoke. So I have a few last words for some semi-famous people. Henry Seward, who's actually a kind of a distant relative of mine and the architect of the Alaskan Purchase, was asked, what are your last words? Do you have any? And he said, nothing, only to love one another. Beautiful, inspiring words. Betty Davis' words were a little more cheeky. She did it the hard way. Del Coase was a comedian, and he said, thank God I'm tired of being the funniest person in the room. Last words can leave us thinking, pondering, and even haunt us. I remember visiting my grandfather, who was in hospice, had driven down from Haskell. I remember going up to that hill to the hospital in El Paso, kind of dreading those moments, but also happy that I could spend some last moments with my grandfather. My last words to him were, I love you, I'll see you again, and he said, I love you too, David. The next day or so, he passed away. 
I always will treasure those holy moments that I had in those hospital rooms, just holding his hand and having a few moments of conversation with him. But not everyone has those beautiful moments with the loved ones. We've all heard stories of spouses having an argument before they leave for the day and one of the spouses never returning again, wishing our last words could really have been filled with love or admirations. I've been a part of too many funerals where family members secretly share their regret with me of wishing they could have said something more or less to a certain family member before they passed away. Last words are powerful. So why these words from Jesus? These words can set us on edge. No one wants to be forsaken, especially by God, by by their Father. How does Jesus, who is part of the Trinity, feel he's void from God? Some believe at this moment that God turned his back on Jesus, or God abandoned Jesus at this moment because Jesus was taking on so much sin. There was even a a theory that Jesus was not really even there in his body, but was on a cliff laughing on what was going on. I'm not there, but I do think Jesus felt forsaken and in pain in those last moments. Even though these are some of those challenging words, there's beauty that can be found in it. In the pain-filled moments, Jesus was like us. Felt the pangs of the human existence that many of us have felt at different points in our lives. He prayed for this cup to pass from him. He didn't want to go through this excruciating pain, but he did. I was in my second year in my first job after college. I was working at the county hospital. I'd interned there, and it was a great internship experience. My first year was going really well. But then leadership started to change in the hospital. The beloved CEO retired. Our director got ousted, and we got a new one. And this anxiety and conflict cloud started to come upon the hospital. I thought I was doing a good job. My evaluations proved that I was doing a good job, but my coworkers started commenting or making snide judgments about the quality of work that I was doing. Once friends were no longer friends, but almost enemies, everyone was walking on eggshells because the hospital was being evaluated and looked at. Every department was being determined if they had too many employees. They were being right-sized. I think that's the correct term. And so people were worried about their jobs and turning to on each other. I once enjoyed going to work, but now I loathed it. Anxiety and stress seemed to be around me all the time. I kept wondering, hey, is this what work is all about? God, where are you? I didn't like my life at the moment. God seemed very, very distanced. There are songs we all know, songs we're very familiar with. If Sai or Charles plays a few notes, we go, hey, I know that song. And there are songs we sing in this church that you don't even have to look at the screens. You know them by heart. You just have to hear the first verse, and you can sing along with them. So we're going to play this game here. If you're online or in person, I'll say the first verse of this song, and I'd love for you to sing along. I'm not going to sing because I cannot sing, but I will... uh, Say the first verse, and if you want to sing or say along with me, I would love that. Jesus loves me, this I know. Y'all are great. This little light of mine. Go tell it on the mountain. Y'all are excellent. See, these are all songs we know. They're part of the rhythm of our life, especially if you grew up in the church. You know them like the back of your hand. We just hear the first verse, and then we know the rest of the song. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people might have been set on edge, while others might have said, hey, wait a minute. I know this song. This is from Psalms 22. If Jesus were continued in saying after, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He might have said, why are you so far away from saving me? For my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer me by night. But I find no rest. The Psalms are these beautiful, raw stories of 
humanity. It's like reading somebody's diary and telling about the whole ups and downs of the human experience, of the history of the Israelites, of the histories of what it means to be just a person in day-to-day life. These Psalms, and especially this verse right here, reminds us that Jesus was fully human. He knows what it likes, he knows what it is to feel the pangs and anguish when life is not going the way you expect it to go or want it to go. Jesus knows what pain and suffering is all about. Jesus felt forsaken. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was spit upon. Jesus was abandoned by his friends. Psalms were the songs that the people sung. Joni Mitchell said, songs are like tattoos. They stay with us. They're imprinted in on our souls. If Jesus could have uttered more of the verses as he was in the throes of death, some of the crowd might have joined in as he, because they knew the words to Psalms 22. And you, our ancestors, trusted. They trusted. And you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. See, your scripture are like these songs that bring us comfort when life is going awry, when life is not going the way that we expected or that we expect and we have to grit and bear it through them. These songs were the songs of the people. These scriptural words might have brought comfort to them. Perhaps these words sustained sustained Jesus in the last moments. Because Jesus knew the history of his people, knew the history of these songs. Jesus knew that God heard the pangs of the Israelites. Jesus knew that God heard the cries of them in the wilderness while they were lost and brought them water and manna. Jesus knew that God heard his people's pain in Babylon and brought them comfort. Since Jesus was a child, he would have quoted the Psalms and uttered and muttered them and tried to put them on his soul to know them. O God, O you, I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Jesus would have said these words as he worked to memorize them with his other classmates. These scriptures that, which embodied who he was as he walked here on earth. He and others would have recited the Psalms in times of stress and trials. And maybe the final words of Psalms, 20, uh, Psalms 22 brought him solace. To him, indeed, all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to dust and shall live for him. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Sometimes people's last words are not their last words. They have more to say than the words they utter. The last word someone speaks sometimes points to something more, like the first verse in a song. The way a person lived their life lasts longer sometimes than the words they even spoke. The lies may be pointing to something bigger, to something more. We may not know the final words of our members, John Guiling and Betty Will, who have gone to the church triumphant. But through their bequeaths, they were able to enhance our online worship experience. People in our area and around the world are able to experience our beautiful worship experiences. People near and far can experience Christ for the first time or Christ in new and fresh ways because of the equipment they provided. John and Betty's words are echoing in eternity. Words not uttered but lived through faithful stewardship. This is the one reason why we established the First Church Permanent Endowment, allowing people to have an eternal impact on people's lives. Still today, John and Betty's words of faithfulness ring in our lives. Last words are often not the last words. The way people lived their life and who they were as they spoke into existence. The legacy they left through the lessons they taught others. The way they boldly loved and brought hope to others stays with us. How many times in your own life have you said something a certain way or had a certain mannerism with your hands when you're reacting to a situation and you stop and it reminds you of a loved one who passed away? That's exactly how my mom or my grandfather would have done this or that. 
and it stays with you. It's tattooed on your soul. Just like the words, the last words that Jesus spoke on the cross connected you to a profound song and not just the first verse. When you first read Jesus' cries, the first verse of Psalm 22, it can be hard to hear. But as we lean in closer to the cross, we hear the rest of the song. The first verse doesn't always tell what the rest of the song is going to be about. The first word is not the last word. Jesus' pain on the cross does not have the last word. Our current pain and suffering does not have the last word. The feeling of being forsaken does not have the last word. Being mocked and beaten does not have the last word. Christ has the last word. It's, it's an invitation to transformation. It's a reminder that God is always with us. It's a word of love. It's a shout of victory. Jesus knows the end of the song and knows the end of our story. He knows who will finally deliver him. Jesus knows salvation will come. Jesus cried out a song of victory. It's a song of a promise of a better tomorrow for us. Praise be to God. Let us pray. God, as we journey toward the cross, as we journey toward your final days, it can be challenged and it can model and reflect our own struggles and trials that we each go through. But let us take the time to lean closer to you, to hear the rest of the song, a song of victory, a song of triumph, a song that you are always with us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please rise. How wonderful, how marvelous is our Savior's love for us. Let us go out into the world and rejoice in that. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen.